morning and welcome to another Sunday service at One Faith, One Christ. As we start off this new week, the first day of the week, and we give the Lord our first fruits of our offerings, of ourselves, of our hearts, of our spirit. And as always, we start our service with the call to worship. And so we look to you now to participate in this to be a part of this call to worship because I'm asking you now to give God your glory, give God your best, give God you in this call to worship. And so we start this call to worship off with a scripture. And, you know, some may be wondering, why do I start this off with a scripture? I, I, I start it off because I need something to give to you so that you can work with, so that you can be empowered with so that you can praise God with. So let's look at Psalm 136, the 136th number of Psalm. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. And let us do that through our praise and worship this morning, to give thanks to the Lord for that mercy that endures, for that mercy that allows us not to be cut down in our indiscretions, not to be cut down in our iniquity, but allows us to live another day as we journey toward Righteousness in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord, everyone. The Lord. Feel free to clap with us and lift your hands as we worship him today. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. So glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Let's sing, Lord, I live. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. And I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came, you came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. 
Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Thank you, Lord. We lift you up this morning. And we worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord. Worship you with lips of adoration. We worship you as a company of praise. Let this temple be a place where your glory is embraced as we stand in awe and worship you. Worship you with lips of adoration. We worship you as a company of praise. Let this temple be a place where your glory is embraced as we stand in awe and worship you we worship you with lips of adoration we worship you as a company of praise let this temple be a place where your glory is embraced as we stand in awe and worship you we worship you with lips of adoration we worship you as a company of praise let this temple be a place let this temple be a place let this temple be a place where your glory is embraced as we stand in awe and worship you let this temple be a place where your glory is embraced as we stand in awe and worship you my hallelujah belongs to you my hallelujah belongs to you my hallelujah belongs Yes, Lord, my hallelujah belongs to you. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. Yes, you do, Lord. So You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it, Lord. You deserve it. My hallelujah. My hallelujah belongs to you. Hi. 
praise all of my worship belongs to you lord hallelujah and all of the worship belongs to you let's tell them you deserve it you up in that praise and worship. Psalm 138. And we will recite verses 1 through 3. Psalm 38. 138. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name. For your loving kindness and your truth For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. So, Father, we just continue to ask for that boldness, that strength to carry us through any and all things in our day. And, Father, forgive us for any transgressions we've done, Father God, before you. Help us, Father God, be washed clean in the blood of Lord Jesus today. Help us, Heavenly Father, rise above the sins that we have committed and become, Heavenly Father, greater than those which try to anchor us down and hold us down, Father God. So, Father God, cleanse us and keep us, Heavenly Father, as we continue to need you and want you and have you to work upon our lives to change us, to alter us, to transform us, Lord. So, Father, we can come to you, Heavenly Father, with humble heart, Lord. And, Father, God, although I'm standing in my heart, I'm on my knees before you, Heavenly Father. Looking to you, Lord God, for all of the blessings I need today, all of the protections I need today, all of the grace I need today, and definitely the mercy that you bestow upon me today. So, Father, God, we look upon each and every one today, Lord God, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will look into their hearts and look into their minds and look into their lives and bring your transformative power upon each and every one of us so that we can become the child of God you want us to be. So Father, help us, Heavenly Father, through our sicknesses, those who are suffering through any kind of illness, Lord, we pray that you will look into them and help them, Heavenly Father, to overcome it 
to get beyond it. You built this body. You created this body. You know every single molecule and atom that makes this body function and work. So we know, Father God, that you can extract that illness molecule, that illness sickness, that illness that's there, and bring this body back to the perfect condition you wanted it to be. And Heavenly Father, for those of us who are trying to uh, get better health, Heavenly Father, look upon that and give us, Heavenly Father, the strength to continue on when it seems like it's not working or it's not going the way we think. But Father God, give us the boldness to continue to try in our work upon our health to get this temple back into the shape that you want it to be in, oh, Heavenly Father. And Father God, look upon our finances, Heavenly Father, although our country is going into a bit of a down spiral, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will look upon us and help us, Heavenly Father, in our financial troubles to give us, Heavenly Father, the resources we need to sustain our homes, our families, and again, to keep food on our table, a roof over our head, and clothes on our back, O oh Lord. So, Father, we come to you because we need you. We know that man cannot supply the things that you have to give, Lord God. And although you may send a person into our lives to take care of the situation or issue, but Father God, we know that it was you who did it. We know that it is you who will empower that activity to happen to make changes in our lives. So, Father God, we pray that you will cause those activities to start stirring up and flourishing in our lives so that we, Father God, can overcome the darts of the evil one who is trying to bring us down and destroy us, Heavenly Father. But we know that your protective hand is there to cover us and keep us. So through it all, through the sicknesses, through the financial problems, through the mental problems, the emotional problems, Father, we know that you can heal. We know that you can change. We know that you can fix families and and alter that which is broken, Heavenly Father. So look into those homes that are uh, have issues in their family life. We pray, pray, Father God, that you will mend those problems in their lives and help those husbands and wives reconsider decisions of divorce and move away from separation and allow them, Father God, to have compromise in their relationship so that the two can work together, Lord God. And allow them to have compassion for one another so that they may continue to do the work that you call them to do and be the family that you want them to be. And Heavenly Father, look upon us as our, at our jobs, dealing with our coworkers, dealing with our managers, and our positions in our job. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give us, Father God, the promotions that you so want us to have and give us, Heavenly Father, the patience to wait on that promotion that you will provide so that no one can tear it down. Because once you lift us up, Father God, no one can remove us from that position. So Lord, we just pray that you will look upon us today as we come to you giving us, giving you our first fruits of ourselves, Heavenly Father. We pray that you will bestow upon us the things that you see us to need in our lives, Heavenly Father. I know we may want things, Lord God, but Father God, that is up to you to realize whether that want is beyond our capabilities. Sometimes those wants are beyond what we can handle. So Father God, give us patience to wait on things and to know that you will work them out in the right and proper way. And look upon this service, Heavenly Father, we pray that you have brought all those who you want to be a part of the service this morning. That they will receive the word of God today. And as it goes out over the internet, Father God, that you have gathered all that you want gathered to be a part of this, to listen to what you have said and what you want said. So, Father, we pray for this service. We pray for each and every individual here. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, we're depending on you, oh 
Jesus, we're depending on you. Jesus, we're depending on you, depending on you to see us through. Oh, Jesus, we're depending on you. Jesus, we're depending on you. Oh, Jesus, we're depending on you. Depending on you to see us through. Come on, sing it. Jesus. We're depending on you, oh Jesus. We're depending on you, oh Jesus. We're depending on you, depending on you to see us through. Jesus, we're depending on you. Jesus, we're depending on you. Oh, Jesus, we're depending on you, depending on you to see us through. Come on, one more time. Jesus, we're depending on you. Jesus. We're depending on you, oh, Jesus. We're depending on you, depending on you to see us through. Depending on you to see us through. We're depending on you to see us through. back a little bit that the Lord has given you. So if you're here in the sanctuary, you can come up anytime you want and put it in the offering plates. And for those on the other side of our camera, if you're watching this on anything other than our website, you can go to www.onefaithonechrist.org and press the give button and it'll open up a window for you to provide your tithes and offerings that way as well and for your bank account those that support zell you enter in info at one faith one christ uh, as the transfer to i believe and that will connect you up with our church for your tithes and offerings uh, if you want to use our church address 1327 East Miritania Street, Wilmington, California, 90744. You can send them to us in the mail, or you can come down to the church and be a part of us in the sanctuary here. And if there's any other means that you would like to use to provide tithes and offerings, let us know at info at onefaithonechrist.org, and we'll help set that up for you. We currently have set up a couple of electronic means so I'm sure we can help out in whatever way you want to provide your tithes and offerings. Father God, we thank you for this time of giving. And we pray that you bless every cheerful giver, Lord, those who have given from their heart to provide the resources needed, Lord, to do the services that you want this church to do. And so, Father, we pray for each and every one that you bless them. And, Father God, we pray for this offering that you do bless it, that it be utilized, Father God, in the way and means that you so desire it to be used, Father. And, Lord, we just continue to thank you for your provisions to us that we can utilize to serve you. So thank you, Father God, and we just praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, 
to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily others, and whether you are the receiver or you are the giver of this, the message is for all of us. Finger pointing, the act of pointing out others' faults or to place blame on someone else. This is nothing new to our society and started out in the Garden of Eden where Eve blamed the snake for tricking her. Then Adam blamed God for giving her the woman who caused him to disobey God. Finger pointing goes by another term that I learned from my mother. It's also known as the blame game. I remember this term when I tried to blame someone else for something I clearly did. But she looked me squarely in the face and she told me that we are not going to play the blame game here. 
At that time, I was not thinking that it was a game because for me it was life or death because my mom didn't play. Now, as I mentioned a little bit, the blame game started back at the beginning of time, and to date, we have all played it. Admittedly, some of us play it a lot more than others. Some of us do it or did it for personal deflection to save your own skin. And some do it or did it for fun just to get someone else in trouble. The point is that it involved blaming everything and everyone else for what is transpiring in your life. We want to point fingers. We want to ensure that I don't get in trouble. Even if I did whatever it is I did, someone else has got to shoulder the blame for this so that I don't get in trouble. Now, God has a very interesting perspective on all of this in the Word of God because he makes it very clear to us that he doesn't like finger-pointing. And just like my mom, he doesn't play. And he does not deal with the blame game because he just promises to hold every single one of us accountable for our own life choices and decisions. We are held accountable for what we do. You're not going to be able to get to heaven and say, oh, if it wasn't for my mom, it wasn't for my sister, it wasn't for my husband, my wife, Lord, I would have done better. God's going to look at him and says, you could have done better. You had a choice. Regardless of what they did or what they said, you had a choice. And so you can't blame them for the choice you made. So let's look at Ezekiel chapter 18. And we look at verses 1 through 4 and see what God says about finger pointing, the blame game. Ezekiel 18, verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, What do you mean when you use this proverb? concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Now, as I said, the Word of God is always interesting to me. It covers everything under the sun, including that of the blame game, finger pointing. And he likens this to sour grapes. He uses the proverb sour grapes. My fathers have eaten sour grapes, and therefore my teeth hurt. That's pretty much what the proverb is saying. So the writer of this, Ezekiel, he's a prophet, and a prophet is someone who hears from God and then is responsible to relay that message to a person or persons God directs him to do. So in our scripture, Ezekiel makes it clear that this is a message from God directed to the children of Israel and us, because God wants us to read his word, right? So when we read this word, we cannot discount it that said, oh, it was only for them. God just says you will not use that proverb in Israel. So he's just saying that proverb is no longer valid. So in this message, God points out a proverb that was used and is still being used today. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And this is what they were saying. Our parents and our forefathers have done wrong, and now we are the ones who are made to pay. It's someone else's fault. Everyone else has done this to me. Life just isn't fair, and why should I be made to pay for someone else's mistakes? 
This is finger pointing at its best. The blame game played right. Someone else has done wrong, and now I am made to suffer for it. God knew exactly what the people were trying to say, and he wasn't having any part of it. And we know this because he said that they were no longer going to use that proverb. Now, that didn't mean that they could not say it again. What it meant was that God (coughs) will not accept it for our own ill behavior because they were merely trying to shed all accountability for their own actions and deflect all burden of responsibility onto others. And we do the same. We don't want to show the, the, the responsibility of our actions, and we want to make someone else the blame. Lord, it was them, not me. Hey, we didn't cause all this hardship in our lives. They did. Our fathers are the ones who ate sour grapes, and now our teeth are set on edge. It's not fair that we have been left with this sour taste in our mouths. And some may say, maybe that's valid. You know, people have done things that have caused you or us to be held accountable to something. Most cases, that's not true. And because I am a helpful kind of guy, I'm going to hip you folks on ways to eliminate finger pointing and bowing out of the blame game. Because God is going to hit home several very hard truths. And these truths we need to know and understand all the same. So I'm going to give you some very hard truths. And here's the first one. Take responsibility for your actions. Truth number one, take responsibility for your actions. Have you ever met someone with this kind of mentality? I am not responsible for my life because they are the ones who have done this to me. I mean, clearly, it is everybody else's fault, and the blame should be leveled at them accordingly. Have you met someone like that? That no matter what, I'm going to blame someone else for what's happening in my life. Often people who see things this way have a very warped and twisted view of reality. For example, you may have seen a TV show or a movie where the criminal does something and say he has a brother or a cousin, they're working together and they do something and the cousin or brother gets killed in 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 the course of that activity. And they take some hostages. And then they tell the police negotiator, he says, because you guys killed my brother, you guys now, the blood on these people are on your hands now. And I've always looked at that and thought, dude, if you and your cousin never tried to rob that place, then nobody's blood would have been shed, and now you can't put blame on someone else because of what you did. And even though you may see that in a movie or TV, it has actually happened in real life because they've taken that from real life. People have have done bad things. And then when they get caught, oh, whatever happens next, it's on your hands. (laughs) Again, finger pointing and blame game all done well. here. And also, don't assume to take responsibility for everyone else Because at the end of the day, you can only be responsible for you. And look, God knows exactly what's going on. Nothing gets by him. He knows our hearts, and he knows exactly who to blame. So regardless of what you say, regardless of who you point fingers at, God is already squarely looking at you. God just keeps it real. And he makes it simple for all of us. He says, you take responsibility for your actions, your choices, and your life. And I will take responsibility for everyone and everything else. 
So in verse 3 of our opening scripture, God says that you will not use that proverb anymore. In essence, what God is saying is enough excuses. You don't get to play the blame game with me because I know what's what and who's who. God then puts it bluntly in verse 4. The soul who sins shall die. Very blunt. I don't care who you point fingers at. God says, I see you. I see what you've done. And when I look at that verse, I see the scariest period at the end of that sentence. The soul who sins shall die, period. That is the scariest period I've ever seen. And it's scary because it is a statement of fact. No ambiguity, no wiggle room, no guesswork. Boom. He knows you, and he will deal with you. In other words, those who are to be blamed will be judged. So there is no point in blaming others because God knows what you did, and when you take responsibility, you have the opportunity for forgiveness. So we humble ourselves and take responsibility for our actions. We have the opportunity to be forgiven of them. But as long as we hold on to that and keep pointing fingers at someone else, we'll never be forgiven because we'll never ask for forgiveness because I didn't do it. It wasn't me. Dude over there did it. So let's look at truth number two. Understand this. Truth number two. We are all guilty. God says from the very beginning, we're all guilty. Now here's a truth that most of us find hard to swallow. Because I'm a good person. The things I've done are not as bad as what you did or do. So again, point the finger. My guilt isn't as bad as yours, so that means I must not be that guilty. Honestly, it really bothers me when people finger point at others' faults so that their faults don't seem so bad. I've known some people who, when caught in something, they'll go, well, hey, what about such and such? They did whatever. It's like, okay, <laughs> we'll deal with you. And now that you let me know about them, we'll deal with them later. But what they did is not going to overwrite and atone for what you did. But the reality is, regardless of your finger pointing, you are still guilty of your deeds. The finger pointing may have helped you with how society views you or even how it may help you dis delude your own mind. But in your standing before God, it may have added a penalty point to you because now you pointed someone else out. Now you have, you know, you have slandered and, 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 and messed with someone else's character. So God's like, okay, that's another one for you because you know, not only did you not accept responsibility, now, you're putting someone else at risk. And God may know already what's going on with that person, but the fact that you pointed them out. And then I wonder if that phrase works with God. Snitches get stitches. You see, this was the ultimate consequence for all who transgressed God's law under the, old, of, under the Old Testament. The penalty was death. And actually, that's going to come into play again in the millennial kingdom when Jesus rules for a thousand years. He says he's going to rule with an iron scepter. An iron scepter means that the minute you do something wrong, boom, you're gone. And that's how it's going to work in the millennial kingdom. The penalty of sin is death. Or I should say the wages of sin is death. And when, and when the Jewish people are, are living through the millennial kingdom, there's going to be no finger pointing. Because the minute you do something wrong, Jesus says you're out of the picture. No one can keep God's perfect law because we are all sinners. And the Bible tells us that we're born sinners. But that's why I talk about mercy so much, that even though we're born that way, that God's mercy allows us to work toward righteousness. 
Some of us may know the passages from the book of Romans for all who have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 3.23, and for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 6.23. And James says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. That's James 2.10. So the Bible is very clear that upholding the law, God's law, is impossible. But that's why God gives us grace and mercy. Grace to get it right and mercy to not kill us the minute we do it. It doesn't matter if you have sinned a little or have sinned a lot. The point is, every single one of us has transgressed God's law at some point and consequently we are guilty and worthy of death. Folks, None of us can ever even come close to living up to God's perfect standards or to upholding his holy law in our lives. And therefore, finger pointing is never going to work with God. That's why he gave us Jesus. And when people point the finger at us, if you're a born again believer, they're pointing the finger at Jesus because Jesus says, I'll be the intermediary. I'll be the one who stands in the gap for you. When the evil one comes to say slanderous and bad things about you, Jesus says, nope, I vouch for him. I stand for that person. And thankfully, God has never been interested in condemning us. Never. God's never interested in condemning us. When the first sin was created and committed in the Garden of Eden, did God condemn them? No. Their life changed, but they were not condemned. But God is interested in saving us <clears throat> as opposed to condemning us. In fact, he has only ever wanted to spare us from the consequences of our sins through Jesus Christ. Amen? Look at 2 Corinthians we're going to look at verses 1, or excuse me, 9 through 10 of chapter 1. 2 Corinthians 1, 9 through 10. Yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. So, Paul's looking at this idea that, hey, we got the sentence of death right from birth. And we shouldn't trust ourselves to try and get out from under that sentence. If you're, if you're in law and you try to r represent yourself in a court hearing, the saying is, the person who represents himself has a fool for a lawyer. And most judges will try and talk you out of representing yourself. And here Paul is saying the same thing. Don't try and represent yourself when you have sinned. Don't try and represent yourself knowing that you are sinful. Let God take care of that. Let Jesus represent you. And then you get right accordingly. God has never been interested in condemning us to death because he has only ever wanted to liberate through eternal life. And that's what he said in John 3, 16, the favorite verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him would have eternal life and not perish. This is what God said at the very beginning. And even again, if you look at the Old Testament, like I said, if God really was concerned with condemning, then Adam and Eve would have been poof, gone, no more. So the third truth, finger pointing only leads to stone throwing. Finger pointing only leads to stone throwing. 
Now, here's the third hard-hit truth we need to acknowledge today. Because stone throwing never has a good outcome. When you throw stones, somebody gets hurt, something gets broken. But when we're looking at this stone throwing, we're talking about people being killed. In fact, under the Old Testament law, those that were blamed and found guilty were stoned to death. That was the Old Testament law, where anyone found guilty was stoned to death. When God gave the law to honor the Sabbath, the seventh day, there was a man who was going out to gather wood on that seventh day. God said, do no work. Don't even kindle a fire. And so people found him, and they found him doing this. And they went to Moses, and they asked Moses, what do we do with this man? So Moses went to God, and God said, stone him. So the Old Testament law is very harsh. And because God knows the heart of people, and he knows the finger pointing of people, he says that you can only be found guilty if there's two or three witnesses. Can't be just one person said, I saw him do it. Has to be two or three witnesses. And I'll say this to you. That was one of the things that got me out of jury trial. (laughs) Is there any reason why you can't serve on this jury? (laughs) What is that? You only got one witness. There's only one guy. Was that a problem? Come to the side and talk. Well, I'm a Christian, and according to my word, you need to have two or three witnesses. Judge looked at the attorneys, and the attorneys looked at the judge and said, you're excused. But again, the Old Testament law demanded death by stoning. So finger pointing only leads to stone throwing. Now sin always has consequences, and God judges sin. But his desire has never been to condemn, like I said before. God is not interested in stone throwing. Okay? And ironically, the only person really qualified to throw the first stone in the blame and condemnation of others never did. The only person who has the qualifications <clears throat> to condemn others and throw stones at others and blame others never did. Remember the account where we are given in John chapter 8 when the scribes and Pharisees brought before Jesus a woman guilty of breaking God's law? We're told this in John 8, chapter 4 through, I mean, verses 4 through 5. John 8, 4 through 5. Now, this is the Pharisees and the scribes. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded such that commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? But it's interesting how Jesus answered. So I'm saying the one who is able to condemn, qualified to condemn and qualified to blame is Jesus. But it's interesting on how he answers though. Because he says, "He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. So what Jesus is saying, okay, you want to finger point? Whoever is sinless and guiltless in all aspects of their life, let him cast the first stone. Whoever among you has never breached God's holy law, let that person be the one to pass judgment here. So here's what happened when the finger, when the finger of Jesus was pointed at them. So they pointed the finger at the woman. Jesus pointed the finger right back at them. And here's what happened. Let's go back down to uh, verses 9 through 10 of John chapter 8, or 9 through 11 of John chapter 8. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst 
When Jesus had raised her himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She says, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Although Jesus could have. But what did he do? He pointed the finger at the finger pointers and told them, okay, fine. If you think your sins are less than hers, stone her. You've brought her to me to say that she did something guilty. What about your guilt? What about your situations and issues? So it said the oldest left first. They were the one more wise. They're like, oh, man, we can't mess with that. Especially since I had more years to mess up. <laughs> I can't even compare to what's happening with her right now. <laughs> so it says the older left first. The young were left behind. They were the last to leave. Because they're still thinking, you know, you know, maybe I can get away with this. Maybe I, you know. But anyway, finger pointing was going to lead to stone throwing. And not necessarily stone, stones thrown at that woman, but stones thrown at those individuals. So again, notice how Jesus puts all the onus back onto the individuals for their own conduct. Look at yourself before you start judging her. And Jesus did acknowledge that she did commit a sin. But he says, I don't condemn you for it. Although they pointed the finger at you and brought you here, they got their own sins to deal with. They got their own issues to deal with. And so he says, I don't condemn you either, but don't sin anymore. So Jesus sought to hold them responsible for their own actions and decisions, not hers. You see, Jesus has never been interested in the blame game, just as he is not particularly interested in our condemnation of others. So he doesn't care about our condemnation of others. Again, that's finger pointing. He doesn't like that. He is interested in what we do with our lives individually. And he does not need us to help him figure out who is to blame. He doesn't need us. He already knows. And like I said, because you want to blame someone else, you've now added a tick mark to your little set of sins. The fourth truth. You will be judged. The Bible is very clear. At the end of it all, we will be judged. So knowing that what you've done on this planet before you expire, you will be judged for. And these truths are getting harder and harder, right? <laughs> Aren't they? Now that I know I'm going to be judged, man, this is a little tougher now. Luckily, we are at the last truth for today. Not really. <laughs> There's one more. So far, God says, take responsibility for your actions because we are all guilty. And your finger pointing only leads to stone throwing. With the conclusion to all of it being that you will be judged for your actions, regardless of how many times you try to absolve yourself of your sinful activities by pointing at someone else. God says, I know. You may have pointed, I don't know how many times, at someone else's fault. But yours still remain. They didn't wash away when you pointed to someone else. So back to our opening scripture. The soul who sins shall die. Hmm. In other words, in God's eyes, the person who sins are ultimately the person who will bear the responsibility of that sin. Regardless of your finger pointing, case in point, you are accountable and you are responsible for the way you live your life. Not, every way, not everybody else, not your parents, not your forefathers, not your friends, not your family, not your husband, not your wife, not your children. You are responsible. And although I led with, verse, with verses 1 through 4 in Ezekiel, 
throughout the book of Ezekiel, throughout that chapter 18, God makes this one point painstakingly clear. We are the ones responsible and accountable for our own lives, just as everyone else will be held responsible for theirs. So don't think God has singled you out. No, everybody's singled out. God deals with us individually, okay? You're not going to go up there in a group and, you know, before we get there, oh, man, let's get our story straight. <coughs> you know, we got to tell God this. We got to make sure we got to, you know, we got to dot our I's and, and, and cross our T's and make sure that, you know, we're, we're on one page here. We're responsible for our own lives, and everyone else is responsible for theirs. My mom made this point clear to me as well. No one can stop me from getting to where I need to be. And no one can make me do something I do not want to do. And so, there is no one to blame but myself when I don't make it, nor is there anyone else to blame when I decide to do something wrong just because you suggested it. Those things are on me and me only. And those things I will be judged for. Now, I know I mention my mom a lot. She's a very foundational woman in my life. Taught me a lot of things. And to teach me about these morals and these ethics, to realize that I tried to get out of trouble once because I was messing up in school. My freshman year of high school, I was screwing up, and I blamed my friends. Mom, if you send me to another school, I'll be free of this, and I'll start doing better. She's like, well, you just go to another school, find some more friends, and do the same stuff. Or worse. And she's like, prove to me now that, you can, that, that this can work. So I think at that point where I did change, I stopped hanging out with those friends. And when they did come around, I didn't listen to them anymore because they were, they really got, I'm sorry. I really accepted their things that we did mischievously. It was fun. But then when it really came down to it, I have myself and myself only to blame. Okay. Since God will stand as supreme judge over all, there is really no need for blame. Can't blame anybody else. I don't care what you do. You can point fingers at everybody else that you want. But when you go to meet God, you, you want to tell God, hey, God, I pointed out all these people for you. He said, that's cool. But what about you? <laughs> he says, I got a bone to pick with you. And it's not because someone else pointed the finger at you. Because I saw you. And it just boils down to just a pressing need for every man and woman to do what's right, knowing that we ourselves will one day be judged. And folks, I must tell you something. At the end of the day, the only finger pointing that will matter is the judgment that you receive from God. That's the only finger pointing that's going to matter. So when God points his finger at you, pff, woe is me. Now, to kind of tie this up and show you that God really does not deal with the blame game, let's jump down to verse 20 of Ezekiel 18. So we look at Ezekiel 18, verse 20. And he starts it off with the same thing. The soul who sins shall die. And then he widens out. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So again, God makes it very clear. It's you and you alone. Can't blame nobody else. Nobody else got anything to do with it. You did what you did because you wanted to do it. Regardless of if, 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 if Junebug wanted you to go take somebody's bike, you didn't have to. 
Not that I did it. <laughs> Actually, June Bug stole my bike. <laughs> and I was like, that's funny because my bike was gone. At, and, 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 and then the next day, I go over to my friend Van's house. And then June Bug rides up brand new handlebars. Those are my handlebars. <laughs> like your bike didn't have those handlebars yesterday <laughs> now today you got my handlebars and later on they told me yeah we stole it and, and, and Keith threw your frame on the roof on the house behind me I was like and these are my friends right well these are the ones I separated from in, 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 in the freshman year of high school <laughs> yeah they were bad God says, I will hold everyone equally accountable for how they live their lives. And everyone will one day be judged accordingly by God. So there is no need for blame to be handed out by you. Now let's jump down to verse 25 of Ezekiel 18, 1825, Ezekiel. So as always... You, once you lay down the rules and the law, they say this. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair or your way which are not fair? Hmm. So God says this. The problem here is not my inability to judge between right and wrong. It's yours. So God points a finger at you now. He says, not my problem that I can't judge fairly. And God says, you think you are qualified to condemn others before me? All you want to do is blame your own life circumstances on everyone else, really. Sounds like a bunch of sour grapes to me. And you're the one choosing to eat them. So again, Sour grapes may come to your table, but you don't have to eat them. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. God says to cut it out and stop finger pointing. Take responsibility for your actions and don't play the blame game with me. Because one day, too, you will be judged. So although I, although I said the fourth one was the last, here's the one Big one, okay? It's a solid biblical truth, right? Folks, we need to understand that these scriptures from Ezekiel 18 are not some obscure truth that is only seen in the Bible once. Some have poked at this and said, oh, if that scripture only happened once, it can't be that valid. So much so that God wants us to understand our individual accountability and how he's going to look at us individually he has it littered throughout the bible and so because we don't want to see this as some obscure truth only in ezekiel that it is only taught once in the book of ezekiel oh no these hard truths are taught repeatedly in the scriptures for any of us with a heart to see them but please don't take my word for it. Let's look at what God has to say as to so frequently the case. There is just so much scripture to look at. And it's one of those things, if I really pulled all the scriptures out, we'll be here for all day. But I'm not going to pull them all out. I'm just going to pull out enough to show you that it's not an obscure thing in Ezekiel only. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for their own sin. Very simple one. You can't blame anybody else. I'm not going to take on your blame. Your blame is your blame. I mean, your fault is your fault. My fault is my fault. And I'm going to be punished for mine. You're going to be punished for yours. 
as it the theme throughout this message, you're accountable and responsible for your own life and actions. And your finger pointing will not alter the life of another before God and will not alter yours before God as well. You will not be held accountable for what other people do or say about you. You will be held accountable for what you do. The following is a scripture that illustrates the concept of owning up to one's mistake. So I had to throw in a one that where somebody in the Bible actually owned up to their own mistake. And it's actually by a man who did nothing wrong. And this particular person had to sit through the finger pointing of his friends, telling him, you must be sinful. Otherwise, the stuff that happened to you wouldn't have happened. You must be sinful. You must have done some horrible stuff. And this person owned up to it. Let's look at Job 19, verse 4. And if indeed I have erred, my error remains with me. So first of all, he's saying, your finger pointing, I don't believe what you're saying anyway. And if I did error, that's mine. I got that. And I'll deal with God. And Job says, look, if I have got some things wrong, then that error rests with me and me alone, not anyone else. So we need to take ownership of our actions just like that. Because it is about you and what you've done and not what anybody else has done. I'll tell you this. And um, sometimes, I, well, typically in the morning I go to the bank and get some money for pay, payroll and things. I will see people parked in the handicap spot and they don't have a handicap placard or a sticker. I want to blame them. <laughs> I want to call the police on them. I want to take a picture. I want to do all these things. Like, you know what? Uh, they're going to get their due justice, so let me leave that alone. And that's why, you know, that kind of thing, I take ownership of my own self. That day, if I stupidly park in a handicapped spot, oh, wait a minute. I was going to judge others, but here I am. I haven't done it, but <laughs> I'm just saying. So, we're going to be judged for what we have done, and so we can't finger point others. There will not be a chance for you to huddle together with others to get your stories right, like I said before. Because every one of us is going to give account of himself to God. You're not going to give an account of everyone else or for someone else it's about you and what you've done. So if you lay off the finger pointing, if you lay off the blame game, then you can spend that time working on you, getting you right, getting you correct. And I'll say this, and I've said it many times. If someone does point the finger at me and says something about me, I just tell them thank you. Because now I have a, something else that I know I need to get right. And then a little side note, it just feels good to know that they lost. It kind of makes you a little giddy that <laughs> what they tried to do just failed miserably. <laughs> and I was righteous doing the whole thing. <laughs> so I just tell them, thank you. Thank you for that. You know, now I'll fix it. So from this day forward, let us all learn to live our lives according to God's plan and purpose without sour grapes. And just say no to the blame game. Just say no to the blame game. And like I said, be able to accept it and say, oh, you know, thank you for that. And I'm not going to blame you for anything either. So the way that we need to tackle this, and I've given you all of that, but sometimes it's hard. But thankfully, we have Christ Jesus who can help us because 
He sends the Holy Spirit who gives us guidance and gives us correction. When we want to play the blame game, the Holy Spirit will say, no, I don't think so. Rethink that. And so we need to know that Jesus Christ will send us the comforter. But he will only send it to us if we believe in him. And so we need to realize and understand that the belief in Jesus Christ is not just a mental knowledge of him. To not say, oh, I know that guy. I know him. But I don't follow him. I know him. We need to follow him. And he says the way to follow him is to realize that his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension into heaven were all real. And we have to accept that. And in accepting that, we believe upon Jesus Christ. Because in believing that, we believe that, that those four things that happened brought upon, brought upon us salvation. Where finger pointing means nothing. And like I said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Jesus Christ says, through you, through him, their strength. Through him, the words bounce off. So if you want to take on that invincibility from Jesus from finger pointing and also to curb your finger pointing, I give you an invitation to accept him today. To take on the shield of Jesus. A, 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 what would you say? A, not a two-way shield, but it blocks your finger pointing and it blocks the finger pointing of others. So if you want to accept Christ Jesus today, first realize that he died for you. He went to the cross for you. And I'll lead you in a prayer of acceptance. And once you've accepted Jesus, then you're on your road to salvation. And he says, you work that out between you and him. We're here to help you in a way, but you need to first start by accepting Christ Jesus. So if you want to accept him, we're going to lead you in this prayer. And you pray this prayer in earnestness and sincerity. And you will be accepted by him. He's not going to wait a week to go through a job application. He's not going to wait a week to do reference checks on you. It's immediate, right now. Your acceptance with him is right now. So if you want to accept Christ Jesus, I would ask you to bow your heads and pray this prayer and mean it. And again, if you're driving or flying a plane, Land your plane first. Move your car to the side first. Father God in heaven, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for beating death and resurrecting to life again. And thank you for ascending into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father, to be my advocate before him. Help me, Father God, to eliminate the blame game in my life. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for saving me. In your name I do pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and meant it, welcome to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew likes to put it. Now you're part of the body of believers, Christian followers, or I should say followers of Christ, which we are called Christians. So we're here at one Faith, One Christ would like to help you in that walk if you so desire. Our address is 1327 East Muritania Street, Wilmington, California, 90744. This is where we congregate. You're welcome to join us. Or if you're on the side of the camera, we're welcome. Uh, we also welcome you there as well. Our website, 
www.onefaithonechrist.org. You can go there to get information about our church, contact numbers. Uh, you can get our church number, which will go to answer machine most times during the week, but I will answer it as soon as I can. And also have my cell number, which you are welcome to call. And uh, we can handle whatever situation um, you have. And <coughs> just to know that we have resources here, Bibles you may want. If you want a Bible, we'll send you a Bible. Just let us know at info at onefaithonechrist.org. That's our email address. Let us know uh, if you have any needs that we can try and help. Just let us know at that email address or send us a letter at the church address. We want to help you in your walk, so whatever we can do and whatever means that you want to get to us, call me, email, or come to the church or send a letter to the church. We want to ensure that your walk with Christ is proceeding along, okay? And to that end, we want to assure you that we can provide you with Bible study. We have Bible studies on Wednesdays and Fridays at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. They're hosted through Zoom, so if you want to be a part of our Bible studies, send an email at info at one faith one Christ and let me know so I can send you the link. And just so everybody knows, again, I used to send the link out every 30 minutes before the study, but since it's the same link, it never changes. I'm not sending that email anymore. And if you don't have that link, email me at info at one faith one and I'll send it to you. So please, everyone else, bookmark it so that it's there for you to utilize come those nights of study for Wednesdays and, thir and, and Friday nights. Wednesdays, we're studying Matthew. Thursdays, um, excuse me, Fridays, we're studying uh, numbers. And the numbers are getting interesting. As I told the study in numbers, people are going to start dying. That's usually the draw. It's like, oh, people dying. Because we're all morbid. We want to see <laughs> as we're driving along the highway. We got to look at that accident. Oh. So again, <laughs> the point is we want to study the Bible together. And so join us on our Bible studies Wednesdays or Fridays, either one or both. And then uh, on that end, too, uh, you need to start talking with Jesus. You need to have a little talk with him. So our prayer meetings are one avenue that we have on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And we get together as a group and pray because he says when two or three are gathered together, there Jesus is in the midst. So we, we, we have a number of people who gather together and we pray, and that's on a phone line through a conference call. And if you're in the United States, that number is 657 three nine zero four seven one six and um, if you want to tee up prayer requests you can drop us an email at info at one faith one christ dot org and we can tee up your prayer requests if you want or when you call in you can let us know the prayer requests at that time and you can either pray with us or just listen and uh, all is welcome to join us in prayer and if you're outside the united states these are some of the countries we have right now. And um, I know for some of the countries they did ask for these, but I guess the timing as it worked out. Um, see, right about Thursdays at 7 p.m., it's usually in the middle of their work day. <laughs> and so if it works out for you, then we want to make sure that you're able, if you're in one of these countries, to be able to be a part of our uh, prayer meetings and so if you're in from another country, drop us an uh, email at info at onefaithonechrist.org, and I'll send you a number to your country as well as an access code. So also, too, let me know if you're new and want to be a part of any of these numbers here. Send me an email at info at onefaithonechrist.org so I can send you the access code so that you can join us in our prayer. And again, we are so thankful to have you with us, both in here in the church proper, as well as the on the other side of these cameras. And as always, I pray that we've said something to you that has blessed you today, that has stirred your heart and your mind to 
work toward a betterness. Okay? And that's what we're trying to do here to give the word of God because it is the spring of life. It is the wealth of information. And we want to make sure that we're giving that out to you free of charge. And so we just continue to thank you and thank God for you. And we pray that you will be blessed today for the word and for all that we are trying to do to serve God in his kingdom, to provide for the needs of those he sends to us. And help us, Heavenly Father, to be guided by your word to faithfulness, to righteousness, to removing the blame game attitude from our lives and to stop us from finger pointing and just help us to be righteous. And may the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus as we all sing together. Amen. God bless.